Okay, so um, how, how we would like to organise the discussion uh, is that uh, we want to have some specific questions for Nico first, and then specific questions for Lewis, and then we'll broaden out the discussion. So specific questions relating to, you know, if you like, the technical aspects of the papers, etc. So first of all, questions for Nico. Yeah. Yes, there's a question about um, the method. Okay, I apologize. I am a mathematician discussion. So perhaps my question will be very naive. And uh, when uh, the technique you, you use to make a modification of the uh, situation of uh, your uh, glycan, uh, uh, it's just by um, <coughs> inputting an enzyme okay, or, uh, uh, or uh, glucose, okay, some kind. And with some density, yeah. and you expect that statistically it will uh, evolve in this direction of the swamp. Yeah. But in 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 live uh, 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 yeah. probably there is something which makes uh, the uh, enzyme uh, much more local okay, uh, in its uh, action, okay. and it's because it interacts with other actors. Yes. Okay. So, do you try to develop uh, this kind of, of uh, the interaction between the two local acts. I see your point, and it's not at all naive <laughs> by any means. Um, so the targeting of the glycosyl transferase, this is actually the key point in getting this pathway efficient. Um, and so several of these glycosyl transferases in the Golgi do interact with each other. And it remains very poorly characterized how they do that, but we know which parts of the sequences are involved in doing that. And so when we fuse like human glycosyl transferase catalytic domains to the targeting signals too. So the targeting signals contain the information where the protein will end up in the cell. And this is in part of the protein sequence and the structural basis of that is not understood but we know that it's in that sequence that the information is somewhere. Okay? And we use that entire sequence from the yeast glycosyl transferases to fuse it to the human ones to try and do exactly what you said. And it's a critical point. You know, if you don't do that, if you don't take it into consideration where you make that fusion, you get like a bit conversion, maybe 10% from one substrate to the product, but you'll never get 95%. Okay. So we took that into account in the design. Yeah. That's one of the things that took most time actually to optimize that. Yeah. Um, because uh, you say so, so far to discuss uh, uh, all of mathematics uh, in fact, but at this level, so when you try to manipulate uh, several actants, uh, perhaps you need uh, uh, some uh, con control or mathematical control to, uh, to, uh, to exploit your, your data. So I, I can comment on this. I've been thinking about this as well. Why did we manage to get all of this done without any mathematical modeling? Right. Um, yeah, and and so I think one of the reasons is that this is not a very I have to be careful what I'm saying, but it's not a very carefully controlled pathway, in the sense that um, this happens in the Golgi apparatus when the protein is on its way out of the cell. Okay, so whatever happens to these carbohydrates, to a very large degree of approximation now, might will not be toxic to the cells very much because the cell is on the, in the process of throwing it out anyway. Yeah, yeah, this is <laughs> taking abstracting a lot of biology as to why that may not be the case. But it's a, it's, you can consider it as a secondary metabolite pathway. Uh, it's not very stringently regulated. It, there is no feedback or very few feedback inhibitions in that system. Right? Which is probably why um, you know, just pumping up the levels of enzymes works. You, know, you, get, you get all the products, but there's very few products that actually do feedback inhibition in previous steps which is very different from primary metabolism. Right. So that's my take on this. Yeah, that's the one okay. May I say something directly to that? Yep. I think uh, that uh, clinical biology is not in the attention so much of mathematical modeling. As far as I can see, there would be a need for that, but it would be a great help if the biologists could identify topics where they may be useful for. And I think uh, uh, if you need a model, for instance, to do good experimental design, you, we, what you cannot, because you have to have an understanding of underlying processes. Yeah. So I can comment on that. So what I was just saying is about the steps of the pathway that happen in the Golgi. 
But all these Golgi enzymes need sugar nucleotides. And the sugar nucleotides derive directly from primary metabolism. That happens in the cytosol of the cells. And there you do have these typical feedback control mechanisms that you have in other aspects of metabolism as well. And so there certainly, if we would have to optimize, if you have to, have to build in new sugar nucleotide metabolism, I think that would be a very fruitful area of modeling. But we should take some time outside of this discussion. I, I think it's not so very well aware in the community that there is a really open mm. field for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Other questions for Nico? A brief question. The, the, the glycodilid was done in yeast or in an animal? So, um, so well, it was done in mammalian cells, in yeast, and in plants. Right? Mm -hmm. And can you introduce this into any mammalian cell? Or um, well, we've we've done this in HAC293 cells, which are human cells. We've also done it in CHO cells by now. Um, and I think there's basically no reason why it couldn't be extrapolated, except perhaps in like fully differentiated cells. Mm -hmm. you know, cells that have to make up a particular tissue. I think there it would be more difficult because that's where carbohydrates play an important role in cell-cell contacts. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I just wanted to say it was a great talk, very much enjoyed it. Just playing devil's advocate here, you know, could you not just introduce, let's say, a you know, clickable amino acids, unnatural amino acids, and then, you know, attach whatever, you know, carbohydrate you would like in which position. Right. You could. I mean, and some people are doing things like that. But the, the point is a little bit, um, one has to generate the native linkage for most purposes, um, you know, because some of these applications are going to be for therapies that have to be injected lifelong. So any suspicion, even of immunogenicity, would com completely kill your project. Yeah. I think that's the problem. For diagnostic tool, really no problem. But for therapeutics, I would be a bit more concerned. Yeah, well, it's a more general question, but I wonder if you could comment. I mean, the diversity of, of glycans is phenomenal, and it seems to be overlooked a lot in molecular mechanistic understanding and biology in general. Yeah. There's a lot of energy required to build all these chains for yeah. cells. Do you, do you want to comment on the trade offs between that in general terms, just for. Yeah. So I think um, it relates to probably the question as to why in evolution you get this huge diversity at, at a substantial energetic cost. I think carbohydrates, and so when I show this to my students, and if you look at here, an electron micrograph, for example, of an erythrocyte, red blood cell, the top 50 nanometer or so is all carbohydrate. So for anything that approaches a cell in general, the first thing that is encountered is a layer of carbohydrate, which you call the glycocalyx of the cells. Right? And so, like, that's why so many viruses and, and pathogens in general recognize the carbohydrates first. And I think that's also where the diversity comes from. You're at the battlefront between pathogens and mammalian cells. And, and so, it's well known in influenza, for example, that an influenza virus in birds will recognize a different linkage of sialic acids than the one in mammalian epithelial cells. And so, and it's very, actually the WHO is now using that to monitor new viral isolates for sequence variants that threaten to become infectious for humans. And so I think that's really where it comes from. I think there would be a chance to use mathematical modeling in this case. Yeah. Because I think recognition of cells very much go on this way. But it's not that. No. In fact, it was Endel who told me we should look at that. I, I, it could be in some problems which we have with our new immune system that layers of these dyes are destroyed. I'm too naive, but it could happen. I think you're very close to the truth. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned in, in yeast that it has these gigantic high mannose uh, uh, clusters, uh, and yet with this OCH1 mutant, uh, you obliterate all of that. So what's the phenotypic consequence of that? And it seems like you were just saying that there's a tremendous energy investment in there, and you could, it seems like cells should do better. Yeah. Well, so different yeast species differ as to the extent to which they are, um, they are dependent on that particular layer of the cell wall for their stability. So if you take Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which most of us use, and the baker's yeast, 
that has a very thick layer of nanoparticles. <coughs> so there the carbohydrates are really gigantic, up to 200 manos residues. Now, one of the reasons for us to choose Pichia pastoris is because by nature it only has like 14 or 15 manos residues. So if you kill that, the cell is going to be, is going to be suffering much less than a Saccharomyces cell in which you kill the same pathway. Um, and so in, in Pichia, when we, when we do that, we reduce it from 14 or 15 manos residues to 8, which is not that much of a difference. And then the yeast cell doesn't suffer at all. At least I mean, you have to be a little bit careful. I mean, you have to keep a few percent of the activity for it to, to be happy. Um, but it doesn't suffer so much as Saccharomyces would do. So it's a question, I mean, you have these pathways and we, all, we think they're conserved, but in the fungal kingdom we have as much diversity as we would have in any kingdom of life. And so you, you can choose a bit. Um, okay, two quick questions there because I want to give the rest of the time. I was just, just wondering, uh, uh, you removed the glycolization pathway from, uh, from the eukaryotic system, but what would it take to get a similar production system uh, in bacteria? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, what? Well, no, I can't correct. <coughs> okay, so the, I think one of the leading people in that field would be Marcus Eby at the ETH in Zurich. Um, I did my postdoc there, so where, where we were trying to rebuild um, um, glycosylation pathways in, in bacteria. Um, and you can do that. You can actually attach carbohydrates, not of this nature, but of bacterial nature. There are some bacteria that actually put glycans on asparagine, and the most famous one is Campylobacter jejuni, one of the food pathogen. Um, that, that puts carbohydrates on there of a completely different nature, but it never has this folding catalyzing role as you find it in eukaryotes. Um, so there's been co-evolution of these glycans with the chaperones that help in folding proteins and that has not been implemented in, e in E. coli yet and it would be hard to imagine how to do that. So these kind of proteins don't fold well in E. coli? No. Yeah. Okay, there's a quick question over here then, Lewis, you can... But Nico, I have a similar question. Mm -hmm. What is this protein catalyzing role if you can cut off almost everything? Yeah. <laughs> well, so the, the clue is that we cut it off after the folding has happened. Right. Mm -hmm. So we keep everything intact in the ER, there the old folding happens. So you need the ER and <coughs> yeah. you need all directions in the ER. Yes, yeah. you cut it off, then you have a single glue knack, and if there's any contact between the glycan and the protein surface, it's through that first recipe. That's why we keep it. Mm. Okay, do you want to ask your yeah. question and then so, we'll move us to your... So there's been this uh, approach with uh, antibodies to to uh, produce aglycosylated antibodies in E. coli <coughs> and to engineer even the FC. So they, they, they can be produced. Uh, so how you compare the, your strategy for producing a therapeutic protein um, in these years which lacks all this glycosylation compared to a strategy in which you uh, produce uh, a form, a variant of, uh, of the therapeutic protein lacking <coughs> glycosylation? I mean, that's a good point. It can be done. Uh, but the yields of these strains are not very good um, at this moment because it's not just the carbohydrate which is important. You need all the disulfide bond formation uh, in the appropriate way to make full monoclonal antibodies. So you can you can get some molecules out, but this, to to my feeling, there's a long stretch to go before it becomes competitive to eukaryotic expression systems for antibodies. Yeah. Okay, so let's take some questions for this. You have a question about uh, the way that you uh, moved the operons of the synthetic injectosome into, into the, the, the E. coli K12, the non-pathogenic E. coli. Uh, it seems that in the, in the original uh, strain, these are grouped in uh, 35 K kilobase pairs uh, region okay. that you have scattered as uh, single operons being scattered along uh, the E. coli K12 genome. So I was wondering, uh, first, w what was the reasons for this choice? And second, I'd like to know uh, what's the production of in injectosomes, if you have been able to measure it and compare it between the, the synthetic injectosome and the uh, natural injectosome. Okay, so um, so the reason to, to uh, amplify in different operons was to remove uh, sequences that were not wanted, especially uh, regulatory elements and effectors. 
please. We don't want to inject any of, any of those except the ones that we, we choose, okay? So we introduce this in the chromosome um, and we compare the expression of the protein. The expression uh, is very similar to the one in EPEC using this approach. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you compare the assembly of the injectisome, uh, we produce like between 50% to 70% of the amount that you obtain in EPEC. So it is reasonable and good. It's not better than EPEC, but it's difficult to, to, to achieve what nature has done and single shot and first shot. But it is very similar to, to the amount of uh, injectism produced by EPEC under induction, optimal induction conditions. Yeah, because uh, bad bacteria, uh, because they are lying too, uh, do, do you think they can uh, adapt to, to, to uh, your, uh, uh, the function you ask? Is it is a type to uh, domesticate them in some sense. Okay. Well, what is the reward for them uh, to, do, to do that? Okay. Well, uh, probably there is. <clears throat> it's, uh, this is a good point because it means uh, what is the reward in nature? And so probably you will have to, yeah, so the thing is that uh, you will have to, so once you engineer this, probably there's no reward for the bacteria initially. And the thing is that in the laboratory, there's no competitors. And so it means that uh, you can do all this type of manipulation and it's like an isolated system, so the bacteria do not uh, compete with others. Hmm? However, we uh, always compare the growth and the viability when we introduce this type of constructs and we, we see that there's no, we do not affect these basic things like growth rates or viability and it happens also with <coughs> the type 3. So it's not, uh, bacteria is not uh, growing uh, worse. But in any case, uh, the, the point is that uh, probably uh, this is not something that the bacteria acquires, like in nature, a trait that is acquired to, to fit better into an environment. It's something that you force to, to, to express. So, and the, probably uh, these bacteria will be adapted only to a niche in which they can really compete with uh, whatever is, is, uh, is found there. But you have to make adaptation into uh, engineer strength. So they have also the ability to compete with, uh, the, for instance, the microbiome of, that is found in your gut. So <coughs> and we have, <coughs> uh, sorry, we have used uh, K12 because it's a strain that uh, it's a wild type strain that we use most, mostly in the laboratories, and this uh, is an easily is a microorganism that is easy to manipulate, but it's not a good colonizer. Okay, so the metabolism is not good for competition in the gut. So, but the good thing is that you can move these modules toward other strains or to, that are better competitors of, depending on the application, for instance, if you wanted to, to colonize your, uh, your uh, gastrointestinal tract, for instance, that can compete with other bacteria that are found there, because otherwise they will not be able to do the function that you, you want to do. And so that's a good point because it would be uh, it has to be taken into account that uh, this bacteria is the intention is to use them in vivo. Then they will need to compete in the environment, and then at the end they, 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 they should be able to, to survive in a hostile uh, environment. So you have to introduce traits also to to improve the metabolism toward the environment in which they. They live, for instance. I have a question. We are for we are modeling the cellular process. It's a chemotactic movement. Now, if you introduce an adhesive, uh, not natural part, does it guarantee that that uh, this uh, chemotactic movement and the flagella is stopped, or is it uh, independent information which it gets, or is it there no coupling? So, <coughs> yeah. Uh, apparently, there's a coupling between addition and flagella. Yes. Uh, this is Normally, it is. Yeah, no, it but is. If In our strain, it is. So once the bacteria attaches to a cell, the flagella stops rotation. 
That, okay. So an infant will require rotation of flagella, a good flagella, to see a good addition. If we don't have a good flagella, flagellated bacteria, and addition is reduced. This is something that I haven't shown, but so it, it somehow, I mean, the bacteria somehow needs this movement also to, to make good contacts with the <coughs> and but it is connected. Somehow it is connected the addition with the stop of the flagella, even with this system, even with this. This synthetic. is what I'm asking. Natural it is, but in your case it could it be is. that it doesn't give the chemistry, which maybe is necessary. But it gives you it, the answer. Is yeah, it, uh, it, you see in the video and if you see how the bacteria. So this K12 strain swims like crazy, so it really mm -hmm. okay. moves around. What, what when they uh, attach to a cell? They stop, you see clearly in the video, right? Okay. They stop, no, no, with this. Also, okay. yeah, yeah. So you see it. You see the targeting and then you see it stop. So this, uh, somehow, uh, the flagella has uh, reconfigured to a uh, position with the, it's not motile anymore. It's a, it's a signal. A it's a signal, signal, yeah, to, to signal the GMP or. Okay. Okay, from the. The video, beautiful, beautiful video, is actually amazing. Um, the bacteria seem to be also interacting with each other as if there was some sort of biofilm sort of state being induced by the adhesion of the initial set of bacteria. Did you observe that? Do you, do you start inducing quorum sensing? Uh, no, we haven't tested that. We haven't tested if there's a quorum sensing in use or we haven't put a promoter that could respond to, to, to that. We have uh, done some transcriptomic analysis of the, uh, to see what are the genes that are in use uh, soon after the, the addition, but what I mean soon mean uh, like in the first 20 minutes, okay? Just what happens in these first 20 minutes, and the genes that we have found are more related to oxidative stress, for instance. So, so we haven't seen anything. Uh, that indicates, uh, yeah, and also with the lactose uh, simulation, so, so it seems that it's more a metabolic thing related to the contact with a cell than, like a tumor cell than a problem sensing at this every stage, but maybe if we will uh, wait days, then maybe you can see this type of induction in, in hours, but not certainly in minutes. There's a question here then. I was wondering, the, one of the, the possible applications would be that you target a cancer cell and the bacterium would destroy the cell? Yes. And if, if you do so and if you're successful, the bacteria could learn, if I do so, there's plenty of nutrients, I can grow very well and then attack other cancer cells, hopefully, or <laughs> other cells. <laughs> Is there any mechanism to stop them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, in principle, uh, this is like a, that's the point of uh, introducing uh, all this engineering in a non pathogenic uh, bacteria. So you can control um, uh, more or less the uh, antibiotic sensitivity of, the, of your bacteria. And in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why we introduce everything in the all, all are constructed in the chromosome and remove all antibiotic resistance is that our strain is sensitive to all antibiotics. So it's a, it's a way to, to warranty that you can always treat the individual, for instance, with antibiotics to remove the, the bacteria. But usually the concern, although this is what the people think, uh, so you have to somehow control, usually what worries me is how I'm ensure that uh, the bacteria kills all tumor cells, for instance, okay? That, that's totally uh, more, uh, li is, it, is it less likely that this happens than, uh, than the bacteria spreads and, and generate a systemic infection that you can control, okay? And of course, you can always induce <coughs> the toxic gene under certain environmental signals. So you, for instance, you can induce with a molecule that is given uh, systemically, and if uh, you see any adverse effects, you can always uncouple the production of the toxin just simply by not giving this inducer. Uh, so there's different options. So I don't think the problem would be to control the microbe. Probably that to make it 
uh, more efficient and to be sure that you will be able to heal what you want. So you, you showed that you could uh, uh, now use your type 3 secretion system uh, to inject uh, your nanobodies, for instance. Uh, do you have any specific application in mind for doing this? Okay, so uh, uh, there's nanobodies selected against, uh, um, already selected by, uh, uh, for instance, a group of uh, Han Getemans uh, in Ghent, in fact, who uh, and I've been in the, in the talking to him uh, because there's of course the option to, to target specifically uh, some signaling cascades uh, involved in cell proliferation or apoptosis <coughs> with the nanobodies. So you could, for instance, uh, inject these nanobodies against um, uh, this type of, of molecules like P53 or kinases that are involved in cell survival and then block the activity. Uh, them. So it, it is an option, uh, but uh, I'm considering not only the antibody molecules for the liver, as I said, so I think uh, there's many other alternatives, including natural effector of these pathogens to, to do certain uh, functions in the, in the uh, cell host. <coughs> How big a protein can you deliver? And you uh, mentioned the, that IPTG you thought was a problem as an inducer. Could you say why it's a problem and what you would yeah. want to use? No, IPTG is fine in the lab, but you cannot use it even in mice. It's not allowed because it's a carcinogen. So you have to use uh, other molecules for induction. Okay, I mean, you can do it, but it's not something that you should do because it's a molecule that is toxic. So, so uh, usually the people, for, uh, there's other uh, groups that also are using arabinos, for instance, as a sugar that can be used. Uh, Analogs of uh, antibiotics like tetracyclines and doxycycline, which are uh, promoters which uh, are induced to that. And even you have uh, promoters that <coughs> are induced by uh, molecules like uh, salicylate. So, so you can induce your gene of interest with aspirin. So what I mean is that there's options to, to molecules to use in vivo. And I think there was another question. Biggest protein. Oh, the size of the protein. So more than the size, it, 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 what it matters is the folding of the protein. So for instance, tear is a large protein. It's almost 90 kilodaltons protein. And it can, be, it can be easily translocated very efficiently. TFP <laughs> is shorter, it's only 30 kilodalton, but TFP cannot be translocated through this uh, uh, complex product because it falls previously and it blocks the translocation through the injectisome. So the, it, it depends more on the folding of the protein than on the size. So. Or on the unfoldability. Uh, or an unfoldability, because the ATPases uh, that is, are associated to these uh, injectisomes <coughs> unfold the protein through the uh, translocation process. So they also have a function in unfolding the protein. So the protein probably should not fall rapidly in, in the cytosol, otherwise it will not be efficiently translocated. So how worried should you be about this, uh, uh, this uh, redesigned, redesigned uh, bacterial uh, exchange in genetic material with bio populations? To what extent, uh, for instance, if, uh, if your bacteria acquire uh, uh, resistance against antibiotics, uh, it could be more difficult to maintain? Yes. So that's uh, another classical question, let's say, <laughs> they are not concerned. No, it's true, it's true, it's a good point. Because, uh, yeah, there's always the possibility, once you release uh, microorganisms to the environment, that uh, it will uh, exchange genes. Uh, this is something that bacteria has done during evolution very efficiently. And so uh, there's uh, ways to try to avoid this or to reduce uh, the system. So you can engineer the bacteria also so that they are not so competent for recomb recombination or that uh, you can uh, try to uh, eliminate, and there's ways to reduce the genome size and reduce and, uh, and eliminating transposons and also uh, other integrative elements from the genome, so which are not probably needed for your final strain. So by doing this type of things that are feasible now, of course you can 
change even the DNA and introduce a completely seno molecule that would not be able to recombine or acquire genes from outside. But you can, mm, things that are easy to do are simply, for instance, removing uh, mobile elements, transposons, etc., and make the strain less uh, prone to recombination and uh, uh, to, to accept foreign DNA, for instance. That's Good question. Anybody um, want that more than a I was just wondering, if you use these systemically, presumably they would be seriously immunogenic, but will they, would they survive as part of your gut flora or something? Could you give them to treat intestinal yeah. tumors? Or yeah, so the idea, uh, although the people is using the systemic administration more as an experimental model, but in fact with Salmonella they have been using it even in clinical trials and kind of what there was there was a problem in the, in the way that the, the, the dose that it was required to have a certain a, a significant colonization was already toxic for as an endotoxin uh, production also with the LPS etc so there's been some work in human with the with bacteria so I don't think probably systemic administration is the way to go okay so we look more in the applications in which in niches in which bacteria uh, already exist and are more accessible for bacteria, like, like the gastrointestinal tumors or inflammation in the gastrointestinal tumor or the bladder, urinary bladder also. And uh, why not the skin or certain uh, uh, places in which you can really access uh, uh, easily with, with bacteria. So you can target specific cells that are in your skin or in the gut and not uh, thinking on a systemic uh, administration. And also for diagnostic uh, application, maybe you can think on ways to engineer the bacteria so they can uh, monitor the presence of cells, tumor cells, or molecules uh, in the gut and tell you if you have a disease so with this type of approach. Take this last question here. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just wondering, um, if there was like bacteristics, if there was any phenotypic tendency to form biofilms, if so, would it be easy to disrupt biofilms? Then? With uh, when bacteristics to disrupt this, is there any phenotypic tendency to form biofilms? With the, with the strain, we haven't uh, analyzed really if our strain is able to, to form biofilms or to induce. Uh, worm sensing <coughs> molecules. Uh, so, but it's clearer that you can maybe target, generate bacteria not only against tumor cells but also against antigens found in other bacteria, including maybe biofilms. So you could maybe think on bacteria that are able to to attach and attack uh, pathogens or biofilms formed by other bacteria. So, because the, the antibodies are easily produced against different antigens, so you could really uh, think on ways to uh, in targeting your bacteria to maybe a biofilm. So, I don't know if that explains your question or not. <coughs> All right, thank you very much. I think we need to stop there now. Um, so, we are going to have a longer break. Uh, can we all be back here at uh, 3.45?